we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. When the observer is looking at itself, the observer is absolutely silent. If the observer is absolutely quiet, you see what actually is. If the observer is totally silent, then that which is, is non-existent. Hello and welcome to episode 137 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of carefully chosen extracts from the philosopher's talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti, and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is The Observer. Upcoming themes are Effort, The Sacred, and Accumulation. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit our website at kfoundation.org where you can find a growing collection of in-depth articles on Krishnamurti's teachings, along with key topics and a wide selection of quotes. Our online store stocks all available Krishnamurti books and ships worldwide. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review or rating on Apple Podcasts, which helps its visibility. This week's episode on The Observer has six sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's first talk at Brockwood Park in 1974, titled, Who is the Observer? Our consciousness with its content is the consciousness of the world. Because wherever you go, people are suffering. There is poverty, there is misery, there is brutality, which is part of our daily life. There is social injustice. The tremendously wealthy and the poor and so on and on and on. Wherever one goes, this is an absolute fact. And as each one of us is suffering, is caught in all kinds of problems, sexual, personal, collective, and so on. This conflict goes on right through the world, in every human being. And our consciousness is theirs. And therein lies compassion, not intellectual compassion, but the actual passion for this whole human being who is caught in this extraordinary travail. And when one looks at this consciousness, without interpreting it as good or bad or noble or ignoble or beautiful or ugly, just to observe it, without any interpretation, Then you will see for yourself that 
there is a tremendous sense of fear, insecurity, lack of certainty. And because of that sense of insecurity, we escape into every form of neurotic security. Please do observe it in yourselves, not merely accept what the speaker is saying. And when you observe it, who is the observer? Right? Who is the observer that is observing this whole phenomenon? Is the observer different from the thing observed? Is the thinker different from the thought? Is the experiencer different from the thing he experiences? <coughs> it seems to me that is one of the basic things that we have to understand. To us, there is a division between the observer and the observed. <coughs> and in this division, or rather this division, brings about conflict. Wherever there is division, there must be conflict, the Arab, the Jew, and the whole business. So one must be very clear, it seems to me, about this question. Who is the observer? And is the observer different from the thing observed? I look at my consciousness. I don't know if you ever try to look at your consciousness. Look at it as though you are looking at it yourself in the mirror. To look at all the activities conscious as well as unconscious activities of this consciousness, which is within the field of time, which is within the area of thought. Now, can you, can one observe it? Or does one observe it as though it was something outside of oneself? And if you do observe it, is the observer who is observing different from the thing observed? And what makes him different? I don't. Know if are we all meeting each other? We are taking a journey together. Don't let me walk by myself, please. We're all together in this. What is the observer? And what is the structure and the nature of the observer. Is the observer the past, with his experiences, with his knowledge, with his accumulated hurts, with his sorrows, and so on? Is the observer the past? Is the observer the me. And is the observer, being the past, is he capable of looking of what is going on around him now? (coughs) 
That is, if I am living in the past, the remembrances, the hurts, the sorrows, all the knowledge the mind has accumulated, and all knowledge is always in the past. And with that mind, observe. And when I do observe with that mind, I am always looking through the eyes that have been <coughs> wounded, through the eyes that have remembered things of the past. So I am always looking through the past, through the accumulated tradition. And so I am never looking at the present. There is a division between the observer, who is the past, and the active, moving, living present. So there is a conflict between the observer and the observed. May, may I go on? Is this clear? And can the mind observe without the observer? This is not a conundrum. This is not a trick. This is not something to speculate about. You can ex see it for yourself. You have an insight into the reality. That is, the observer can never observe. He can observe what he wants to observe. He observes according to his desires, to his fears, to his inclinations, romantic demands, and so on, and so on. And is not the observer the observed? The observed becomes totally different when the observer is himself totally different. If I have been brought up as a Catholic or a Buddhist or a Hindu or God knows what else, and I observe life, this extraordinary movement of life, with my conditioned mind, with my beliefs, with my fears, with my saviours, I am observing not what is, but I am observing my own conditioning. And therefore I never observe what is. Right? And when I observe, is the observer different from me? Or there is the observer is the observed. You understand this? Which eliminates altogether conflict. Because you, you. you see, our life, our education, a way of living is based on conflict in all our relationships, in all our activities, the way we live, the way we think, is springs from this everlasting conflict between you and me, between each other, and outwardly as well as inwardly. And a religious life, so far, has been heightened conflict. A life of torture. You must come to God or whatever that 
thing is through torture, through conformity, through acceptance of a belief, which are all forms of conflict. And a mind that is in conflict is obviously not a religious mind. The second extract is from the first talk at Brockwood Park in 1970, titled The Observer is One of Many Fragments. In observing, there is always the observer. The observer who, with his prejudices, with his conditioning, with his fears and guilts and all the rest of it, he is the observer, the censor, and through those, through his his eyes he looks. <coughs> and therefore he is really not looking at all. He is merely coming to conclusions <coughs> based upon his past experiences and knowledge. The past experiences, conclusions and knowledge prevent actually seeing. And when there is such an observer, and what he observes is something different or something which he has to conquer or change, and so on. Whereas if the observer is the observed, I think this is really a radical thing to understand, the really most important thing to understand if we are going to discuss anything seriously. that in us there is this division, this contradiction, the observer and the many fragments which he observes. The many fragments make up the me, the ego, the personality, whatever you like to call it, the many fragments. And one of the fragments becomes the observer or the censor. And that fragment looks over the various other fragments. Please do this as we are talking, not agreeing or disagreeing, but observe this fact that is going on within oneself. It becomes terribly interesting and rather fun if you go at it very, very seriously. We are made up of many fragments, each contradicting the other, both linguistically, factually and theoretically. Contradictory desires, contradictory pursuits, ambitions that deny affection, love and so on. One is aware of these fragments. And who is the observer who decides what he should do? what he should think, what he should become. Surely one of the fragments 
he becomes the analyzer. He assumes the authority. One fragment, <coughs> among the many other fragments, assumes the censorship, and he becomes the actor, the doer, compelling other fragments to conform, and therefore brings about contradiction. I don't know if you, if we see this very clearly. Then what is one to do, knowing most of us are made up of these many fragments? Which fragment is to act? Or are all the fragments to act? <coughs> you follow me? Or action by any one of the fragments brings about contradiction, conflict, and therefore confusion. Right? Are we are we communicating with each other? Communication being thinking together. not only verbally, <coughs> but understanding together, going together, creating together. One, say for, one fragment believes in God or doesn't believe in God. And another fragment wants a security, not only physical, but psychological security. One fragment is afraid, another fragment tries to dominate that fear. Seeing this extraordinary <coughs> contradiction in ourselves, what is one to do? The fragments cannot be integrated, which means, which implies there is an integrator, right? That is, the integrator becomes another fragment. So, it is not integration, it is not one <coughs> fragment which assumes a superior position as the higher self or the most intellectual thing and dominates the rest, or one fragment which feels greatly emotional and f tries to function along emotional lines. So seeing this very clearly, What is, what is the action that will be total, that will not be contradictory? And who is it that is seeing the whole fragments? You and <coughs> is it another fragment that says, I observe all the many other fragments? Are we moving together? Or <coughs> there is only observation without the observer. Have we, can we go along? 
You understand my question? Can one, is there an observation, the seeing, without the me as the observer seeing, and therefore creating a duality, a division? That's really our problem, isn't it, basically? We have divided the world, geographical world, as the British, the French, the Indian, American, Russian, and so on, and inwardly we have divided psychologically the world, those who believe and those who do not believe. My country, your country, my God, your God, and all the rest of it. And this division has brought about wars, and a man who would live completely at peace, not only with himself but with the world, has to understand this division, this separation. And can thought bring about this complete total observation. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's third talk at Brockwood Park in 1970, titled The Observer is a Reservoir of Knowledge. See the first, how the mind accumulates knowledge. Why it accumulates, where it is necessary, where it becomes an impediment to freedom. To do anything one must have knowledge, driving a car, speaking a language, doing a technological job, you must have abundance of knowledge. The more efficient, the more objective, the more impersonal, the better. Knowledge is necessary. But a mind that is full of this information as knowledge, Can that mind ever be free? Or must it always carry this knowledge, which is always the past, and carrying this past, this knowledge, and meeting the present with that knowledge? and hence conflict. I met you yesterday. You flattered me or insulted me. I have the image of you, which is part of this knowledge, this knowledge which is the past, With that knowledge I meet you today, which is the image I have built about you today, and therefore there is conflict between you and me as the observer, and hence there is conflict between you and me. This is simple enough, right?
So, the observer is the reservoir of knowledge. No? No, please discover this. More fun. The observer, therefore, is the past. He is the sensor, the entity that has accumulated knowledge, and from that knowledge he judges, he evaluates. And he is doing exactly the same with regard to himself. He has acquired knowledge about himself through psychologists, And he has learnt what he is, or he thinks he has learnt about himself. And with that knowledge he looks at himself. He doesn't look at himself with fresh eyes. He says, I know, I have seen myself, it's rather ugly. Parts of it are extraordinarily nice, but the other parts are rather terrible. He is already judged, and his judgment is based on the past, which is his knowledge about himself. Therefore, he never discovers anything new about himself. Because the observer is different from the thing observed which he calls himself. And that's what we are doing all the time in all relationships, mechanical relationship or human relationship. Relationship with the machine or relationship with another. All based on the desire to find out a place where he can be completely secure, certain. And he now has sought and found security in knowledge. And the keeper of this knowledge is the observer, the sensor, the thinker, the experiencer. And the observer is always watching as being different from the thing observed. He what the observer analyzes himself or is analyzed by, by the professional who himself needs analyzing. And this game goes on being played. So one asks, can one look at this whole movement of life without the burden of the past. And that's what we are all trying to do, aren't we?
We want to find new expressions, if you're an artist. Non-objective, objective, you know, you play with that game forever and ever. You want to write new books, new way of looking at life, new way of living, revolt against the old, and fall into the trap of the new, which is the reaction to the old. So one sees that intelligence doesn't lie in the hands of the observer, and it is only when the mind is free free to learn, and learning is not the accumulation of knowledge. On the contrary, learning is a movement. And the accumulation of knowledge is static. You may add to it, but it, the, the core of it is static. And from this static state one functions, one lives, one uh, paints, one writes, one uh, does all the mischief in the world. And you call that freedom. So can the mind be free of the known? You know, this is really quite an extraordinary question if you ask it, not merely intellectually, but really very, very, very deeply, to find out whether the mind can ever be free from the know. Otherwise there is no creation, you follow? Otherwise there is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun, then. Is always reformation of the reformed. So one has to find out why this division between the observer and the observed exists, and whether the mind the possibility of a mind going beyond this division, which means the possibility of being free from the known to function in, at a different dimension altogether, which is intelligence which will use knowledge when necessary and be free of knowledge. So intelligence implies freedom, not what one wants to do, which is so immature and childish. Freedom implies the cessation of all conflict, and that comes to an end only when the observer is the observed, but then there is no division. After all, this exists when there is love, isn't there? You know, that word is so terribly loaded, like God, one hesitates to use that word, because it's associated with pleasure, with sex, and with uh, fear, with jealousy, with 
dependency, with acquisitiveness and all the rest of it. A mind that is not free does not know what love means. It may know pleasure. And hence, no, what fear is. But fear and pleasure, fear and desire, a certain or pleasure certainly are not what is called love. And that can only come into being when they, when there is real freedom from the past. And is that ever possible? You know, man has sought this out in different ways. To be free from the transiency of knowledge. I don't know if you follow all this. And so he has always sought something beyond knowledge, beyond thought. Thought is the response of knowledge. And so he has created an image called God. All the all the absurdities that arise from that. But to find out if there is something that is beyond the image of thought, when there must be freedom from all fear. The fourth extract is from the first question and answer meeting in Ojai, 1980, titled The Observer is the Image Maker. When one is observing, is one aware that one is observing, or only aware of the thing being observed? Does the awareness lead to analysis? First of all, let us under, uh, talk over together. What do we mean by ob- observing? There is visual observation. The tree. The hearing. Not only with the hearing uh, with the ear, but also hearing inwardly. You, f- you know this. So when we observe, do we really observe at all? Or we observe with the word? You understand? Are you following this? That is, I observe that thing, and I see tree. So I observe with the word. I don't know if you're following this. Right, sir? There is an observation with the word. So can I find out, can we find out to observe without the word? You understand? Him? Right? Are we proceeding together? So the world has become all important rather than the sea. Right? I observe if we observe if we have a wife or a husband with all the memory, pictures, sensations, the irritations and so on of each other. So we never observe. 
So, next step is, can we observe a person with whom we have lived intimate and so on, so on, without the image, without the picture, without the idea? Can you do it? Mm. <laughs> we can do, perhaps we are able to do, we are able to perceive that thing which we call the tree without the word. That's fairly easy. If you have gone into it, that's fairly easy. But to observe a person with whom you have lived, with, and to and and observe without the accumulation of the memory about that person. If you have gone into it, if you have, if you are interested in it. No, first of all, this observation through the image, through the picture, through the sensation, all the rest of it, through this accumulated memory, is no relationship at all. It's a relationship of one picture with another picture. And that's what we call relationship. But when you examine it closely, it's not relationship. It's my idea and your idea. So, can we observe without an... Uh, in, can we, in the observation, in the, not make an abstraction of what we observe as an idea? You are following all this? Don't be puzzled, sirs. You are not used to all this, are you? So this is, this is what we mean by psychological knowledge. That is, uh, I have built up psychologically a great deal of information about my wife, if I have a wife or a girlfriend. I have built up this knowledge about her, correctly or incorrectly, depending on my sensitivity, depending on my ambition, greed, envy, not all that, Depending on my self-centred activity, you are following all Does this? Huh? So, that knowledge is preventing actual observation of the person, which is a living thing. Right? So I never want to meet that living thing, because I am afraid. It's much safer to have an image about that person rather than to see the living thing. Right? You're following this? So my psychological knowledge is going to prevent pure observation. So can can one be free of that? Can the machinery that builds these images come to an end? You understand my question? Then you would say, How am I to end it? Right? I have got an image about my friend, whatever it is, and it is there, like a tremendous fact, like a stone around my neck. 
How am I to throw it away? Right? Is the stone, the image around one's neck, different from the observer? I'm going slowly into this. Is that image, that weight round your th- neck, round your neck, is that different from the observer who says, "I have an image." I wonder if you can. You understand my question, sir? Meet me, sir. Let's talk together. Move. Is the observer who says, I have the image, and says, How am I to get rid of it? Is that observer different from the thing he has observed? You follow me? Obviously not. Right? Are you f- so the observer is the image maker. I want to see that. Right? Do you meet this? So, what is the observer? Who is this observer that is making the image and then separating himself from the image and then saying, What am I to do about it? You understand? That is the that is the way we live. That's the pattern of our action, and that's our conditioning, to which we are so accustomed, so naturally accept. So we are saying something entirely different, which is the observer is the observed. Which means let me go into a little more. I observe the tree. But I am not the tree, oh, thank God. Mm-hmm. It is too stupid to say I am the tree. Or I have identified myself with the tree. And so on, so on. All this process of identification is still the observer trying to be something or become something. So we have to inquire into what is the observer? Who is the observer? The observer is the result of all the past knowledge. Right? His experience, his knowledge, his memories, his fears, his anxieties, his the past. So the observer is always living in the past. If you if you noticed, you can look watch it yourself. And he is modifying himself all the time, meeting the present, but still rooted in the past. Right? So there is this mom- movement of time, which is the past, modifying itself in the present, going on to the future. This is the momentum or the movement of time. I won't go into that now for the moment. So when we observe, we are observing through the image which we have created about that thing or that person. Can we observe that thing without the word, or and can we observe the person without the image? That means, can the observer be absent in observation. Right? You get the point? Are you working with... 
when you look at a person, of course, if you're a stranger, you have no picture. Or you say, oh, he's a foreigner, throw him out. Hmm? <laughs> but when you look at somebody whom you know very intimately, the more intimately you know them, the more the image. Can you look at that person without the image? Which means, can you look at that person without the observer? You get it? I wonder if you... That is pure observation. The fifth extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk in Sanam, 1978, titled Is There an Observer? When you are jealous, greedy, angry, violent, are you different from that violence, greed, envy, anger? Are you? Or you are that anger, that greed, that violence. So can you observe yourself in the mirror, not as an observer, but only the thing that is being observed, without the observer. Does this become rather difficult? Huh? Or is this an old hat that you have heard before umpteen times and you say, well, please, get on with it. Because this is very important to understand, because as long as there is a division between the observer and the observed, you understand, there must be conflict, there must be effort, there must be sense of either conquering it, suppressing it or avoiding it. So, to totally eliminate altogether effort, there must be no division. Right? If there is no division between the Jew and the Arab, it's finished. Or North Ireland to South Ireland, it's over. So, in ourselves, there is this division, the observer and the observed, which is dualistic. You follow? And we are conditioned <coughs> through education, culture and all the rest of it, through religion, so-called religion, this, to maintain this division to seek God. You are nobody. You follow this whole division, which is the corridor of opposites. And when there is the corridor of opposites, there must be conflict, effort, practice. So, it is absolutely necessary to understand that there is only observation, not the observer, trying to control the observation, that which is observed. Is this clear? Can one do this? You may hear this, you may say, I see the gist of it, I have a feeling for it. There is, I think what you are saying is true, but it avoids you, it escapes, because, but you have to, it is yours, 
you have to find out. Which means that as there is no division between yourself and anger, right? You are anger. At the moment when you are angry, there is no observer. You are only there. Later on comes, say, I have been angry. Then you say, I shouldn't be angry. Or you give reasons for explanation for being angry. Or you suppress anger. The moment of anger, of greed, of violence, there is no division. This is a fact. <coughs> so similarly, is there an observer at all? This very please give your mind, your attention, your love, your care to understand this. Because we are totally, completely eliminating conflict, if you understand this. One can live a life in which there is not a shadow of conflict, not only within yourself, but outwardly. And this is immensely important to understand. <coughs> because, as we said, the manner of your observation in the mirror – there is no mirror, you are watching yourself. But we, for the moment we invent the mirror. Who is the observer? Do you understand? When you say, I observe the tree, the stream, I observe you, and I observe myself, who is this observer? That's very important to understand before we begin to understand the absurd, right? Are we coming together? Are we communicating with each other? Say yes or no, for God's sake. Are you all asleep? So, who is this observer? When you say, I have been angry, or I have been violent, who is that entity that says, I have been? That entity is the observer, isn't it? who says, yes, I have been angry. Is not the observer the past, who says, I have been angry? Right? Not only in that instance, but whenever he observes, the whole observation is the movement of the past. I observe a Frenchman, because I have been told he is a Frenchman. You follow the conditioning, the past, knowledge. So this whole movement of observation is born from the past. Right? So the observer, in essence, is the past. Huh? Right? Don't accept what I'm saying. That's the fact. Looking in the mirror, there is no speaker. Because you are questioning, desperately, anxiously, passionately, you are questioning. 
I hope you are. So the observer is the past, past memories, past experiences, past <coughs> knowledge. With the past, he is observing himself in the mirror. Right? So you have created a division between what you see now and what has been. So there is a division between the observer and the observed, right? Are you getting this? So the conflict begins. <coughs> In your occupation with yourself, don't you have a conflict with another? However intimate your relationship be, Hmm? So, to totally eliminate that conflict, as permanent, everlastingly, one must understand the nature of the observer. Right? And we, as you observe and inquire and learn, the, the observer is the past. So the past is always divided, right? I am a Jew and you are an Arab. The Jew is tradition, propaganda, belief, certain mode of life and so on, so on, so on. And the Arab has his own mode of life and so on, right? So wherever there is division, there must be conflict, not only outwardly, but inwardly. Right? Is this clear? That is, if you are serious, if you want to live completely without <coughs> contradiction, without effort, and therefore live in peace, live in love and compassion. If, you, if that is to be, you must eliminate totally the division in yourself outwardly. Understood this? This is not an idea, intellectual concept, but actuality. So, can you look? at yourself in the mirror without the observer. This is the real issue where, in which rather, identification ceases and therefore division. You understand? Where there is no identification, there is no division. So can you observe your anger, your violence, your hurts and all the rest of it, without bringing in the past memories, past knowledge, past struggles, just to observe without the observer. Then what takes place? You are, <clears throat> I am not asking the question. You are asking the question yourself. Then what takes place when you are looking at the fact, <coughs> not with the memories about the fact. Right? Is this possible? Can you do it? 
If you can't, you cannot go further. Because this is a very important issue. As man has lived millennia upon millennia, constantly in battle with himself, with the devil and God, with the lower self and the higher self. You understand? This battle, this conflict, you see it in all the ancient pictures, drawings, the division between the that which is good and that which is bad, the constant battle. And why should we live in this way? So we're going to inquire and find out if it is possible to live totally in a different way. That is, if you are serious. So, do you see the truth? Not the idea, but the truth, the fact, the reality that the observer is the past, accumulated memories, knowledge. And so he never perceives the present. To perceive the present, there must be absence of the past, obviously. And there is no effort involved in removing or putting aside the observer. Because you see, the, it is so. The final extract in this episode is from the sixth talk in Ojai, 1978, titled In Meditation There is Neither the Observer Nor the Observed. So, the observer is examining itself. Right? You understand what is taking place? That is, he is seeing himself as he is, not as something to be observed. I wonder if you see this. You know, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror when you shave or when you comb your hair or when you make up your face. You're, there it is. In the same way, you're, the observer is watching himself. Right? Then what takes place? Do it, please. Find out what takes place when the observer is watching himself. In there, I'm suggesting, I'm not saying it is or it's not. It's for you to look and find out. Isn't there a sense of observation without the observer? Right? You understand? Which means there is neither the observer nor the observed. I want to forget this. It's very important because we are leading up to meditation. <laughs> Have you got this? That is, when I am looking, when the observer is looking at itself, the observer is absolutely silent. No? 
when you look at something, hmm, unless you are very silent, quiet, you can't see. Right? You can't observe clearly. You, you may see a bird on a flight or a tree, but if you if the if the observer is absolutely quiet, you see what it actually is, don't you? So there is only what is. Not how to change what is. You get it? And if you observe, if, if the observer is totally silent, then that which is, which is, is non-existent because it's changing too. I want you to see this. This is very important because meditation means, if I may go into it, I will go deeply further, meditation means that there is neither the observer, nor the observed. Do you understand this? No. <laughs> the, med- the observer is put together by thought, right? The observed is also put together by thought. Anger is, put- is brought about by thought, reaction. And the observer who says, I am I'm angry, I must do something about it, is also part of thought. Right? So thought has divided itself as the observer and the observed. And has brought about conflict between the two. So when there is this realize, when there is this insight into the observer, There is no conflict whatsoever. I wonder if you see that. Because meditation is the total elimination of complete conflict. No shadow of conflict. I wonder if you see this. Because the observer is not only what is. Right? You see this? Only what is. That is, one is the result of the cultural, social, ethical, religious, spiritual, economic pressure for a million years. One is that. And that is what actual. Without understanding the actual, like there is no move away from it. I can escape, but the escape is becomes an illusion. You can go take drugs and have an extraordinary experience through drugs which destroys the mind, which destroys the quality and this uh, sensitivity of the mind. Here in this country, drugs are becoming such appalling things. So, in meditation, there is no observer or the observer. Then what takes place in meditation when this total absence of conflict between the observer and the observed, and they both cease to be? 